or not. Is there a reason why this team cannot go to the Super Bowl? Do you see a scenario where Tom Brady is back in the Super Bowl this year representing the NFC? A couple of my friends are those people, by the way, that are trying to get to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. As soon as it was announced uh, via text message from an icon to Colin Cowherd that Tampa Bay was where Tom Brady was headed to, a couple of my friends who are currently free agent at the end of their careers are trying to ring chase. You know, everybody used to ring chase to go to New England. They would take massive pay cuts just to get up there to get a Patriot way, play football with Tom Brady and get another Super Bowl. Now Tampa Bay is becoming that place, and there's no way the Tampa Bay Buccaneers fans could have ever imagined that. I think in the NFC, it's a, it's an old guard. In the AFC, is the new guard, obviously. Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson in the AFC, and Bill Belichick still there. That's going to be a monster. But in the NFC, you got Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, and that 49ers team. It's going to be very difficult to make it back to the Super Bowl. But I don't see how you could ever rule out Tom Brady with one of the most explosive offensive weapons set, which is what the Tampa Bay Buccaneers will have next year. I think they're immediately in conversation And I think they're going to be a team that everybody's going to want to watch. I think they're going to have a lot of success. All right. So you mentioned Belichick. Let's talk about him for a minute because Belichick without Brady becomes a fascinating point. He spent his first five seasons as a head coach with the Browns. He had one winning year in 94. That was the only time he made the postseason. There were a lot of extenuating circumstances there, but it is what it is. In 2008, Tom Brady tore his ACL in the season opener. Matt Castle stepped in. New England finished that year 11-5. and They missed the playoffs. They had been 16-0 and the year before. In 2016, you may recall, Brady served a four-game suspension to start the season. Belichick went 2-0 and with Jimmy Garoppolo, 1-1 and with Jacoby Brissett. That loss was to Rex Ryan. I don't think they realize how huge a loss this is going to be. I faced Belichick one game without Tom Brady at quarterback. All right, and they were 3 and 0 at the time. We ended up going to Foxborough with the Buffalo Bills team, an average Buffalo Bills team, and not only did we beat them, we shut them out 18 nothing. Does it make a difference? It makes a huge difference and they're getting ready to find out. That was Rex with us just the other day. So, McAfee, let's talk about Bill without Brady. What what do you think is at stake for him right now? Well, I think Rex Ryan should take a little bit more credit on himself as opposed to on the Patriots without Tom Brady. I think Rex Ryan and the Ryan family, not only legends of humans, but defensive minds, they're great. And Jacoby Brissett was a rookie quarterback basically at that time. So anytime you have some exotic defenses going against a rookie quarterback, they're going to have success. And the fact that he was able to shut them out is absolutely beautiful. But if you talk about Jimmy G and Jacoby Brissett and even Hoyer, who has had success other places, now granted, he threw like 15 interceptions in one game for the Colts last year. But I think Bill Belichick and Josh McDaniels have the mindset that we can groom a good quarterback here. They, I don't know if Jared Stidham's their guy, but I think they have a lot of faith in the fact that there has been great quarterbacks in their organization who has gone on to do great things in other places. Jacoby Brissett a year ago for the first eight games before Cam Hayward picked up an offensive lineman and dumped him on his knee was an MVP candidate. That's a 100% effect. He was playing great football. So I think Bill Belichick, Josh McDaniels, you saw Bill Belichick not go to the combine. You've seen Bill Belichick do things over the last 20 years that no other coach or GM would be able to get away with, but that's because he has a massive brain. And I think whatever quarterback gets in there is going to be a quarterback that they like, is going to be a quarterback that's good, but I don't see them having a better year than Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I just think it's going to take a little bit for the 70 year old coach. All right. And so let's, uh, one more thing here. You mentioned that the AFC is sort of the new guard, with the exception, of course, of your favorite team, the beloved Indianapolis Colts who sign old man Phillip Rivers if you will, and Rivers trying to get to the Super Bowl for the first time, and he comes to a team in Indy there that feels like it's got a lot of pieces in place with a really good offensive line, and they've got uh, some weapons T.Y. Hilton, etc. How good do you think that team is? Phillip Rivers and the Colts, are they a legit Super Bowl team in the AFC? Well, they're my favorite team because they grossly overpaid me for a long time to do something that was minimal work. So I absolutely love the Indianapolis Colts. I think Phillip Rivers was a good signing. Now, towards the end of the year last year, it did look like old man Phillip Rivers was throwing a med ball there a little bit. But I think he got to the point where he got to the, oh, to hell with it. I'm just going to throw it into defensive meetings to see what we got. I got a DM from Jacob Hester, the old school LSU legend who played with Phillip Rivers with the Chargers. He said, anybody that plays with Phillip Rivers, Phillip Rivers is their favorite teammate because the guy just absolutely loves 
football. He's a competitive man. He likes growing his family and he likes ball. That's all his life revolves around. He told me a story about how one year, whenever they came and played against the Colts, the night before the game, the Indiana High School State Football Championship was happening at Lucas Oil Stadium. Phillip Rivers dragged Jacob Hester over there just because he wanted to see what Indiana High School football was like. This is a guy whose legacy is very much contingent upon whether or not he can get a Super Bowl. Him and Eli Manning had basically the same exact career after that draft night fiasco, and Eli Manning won two Super Bowls. Phillip Rivers did not. The man that loves football is uber competitive. If he can take this team that is very well put together to a Super Bowl, that not only helps his legacy, it helps the Colts and Chris Ballard. I'm just not 100% sure what the hell they're going to do with Jacoby Brissett. All right, McAfee, it's great to see you, my man. Let's do this again soon. You stay safe, and we'll check in again. Thanks, my man. Greeny, you don't need makeup either. I think this should be the new you. <laughs> well, that's a, a debate we can have another time. Uh, coming up next, we'll have First Take, then Sports Center, NFL Live, the latest free agency news. The Jump is back with up to the minute NBA news. Sports Center's back at 6. Two hour bracket special. College basketball's greatest of all time is at 7 Eastern. The top 64 men's and women's players ever. Then a primetime NFL free agency special is at 9. And cap the day with Sports Center with SVP at 11 Eastern. We are here for you with the sports on ESPN. Coming up next on Get Up, when might we see LeBron and Anthony Davis and the other NBA stars back on the floor? The commissioner, Adam Silver, lays out the options next. About questions that are out there, there are still no answers for Cam Newton, one-time league MVP, one-time first pick in the NFL draft, and now clearly on his way out of Carolina, after the Panthers go ahead and sign Teddy Bridgewater, the question becomes, now what happens for Cam Newton? And I have Dan and Swagoo back. Uh, let me start with you, Swagoo. What do you think is the best scenario for Cam Newton from this point forward? To go to Washington and reunite with Ron Rivera, Scott Turner, the offensive coordinator, uh, some familiarity. I know ever. I, I don't. I'm not out on Dwayne Haskins. This doesn't mean that Dwayne Haskins can't be the future for the Washington Redskins and the starter. But I would surely bring in Cam Newton, who I have familiar, familiarity with, and we all know the story. G. This is based on Cam's health. If Cam was healthy, we wouldn't be having. He'd be one of those quarterbacks that flew off the shelf and somebody would have picked him up uh, to be their starter. But at this point, I don't see any reason not to bring Cam in. I said it when I said Teddy Bridgewater should go to Tampa Bay and challenge Jameis Winston for a starting spot or even push him to a higher level than he could go. I feel the same way in Washington with Cam reuniting with a coaching staff he's familiar with and go push the young rookie to be who he is. And then Cam ultimately gets healthy and finds his landing spot to become a starter again. The thing I keep thinking, Dan, is if, if, if Cam Newton was healthy, then he wouldn't be leaving Carolina right now. The Panthers know better than anyone else does. What do you think is the best scenario for Cam Newton now? Yeah, I'd say the Los Angeles Chargers, Greeny. I mean, the Chargers for a couple of reasons. One, Anthony Lynn is an outspoken coach that he wants his quarterback to be able to move. He thinks if you're a stationary quarterback in today's NFL, you're dead. Two, the Chargers are really in a win, win right now mode. I mean, a top five defense. We all know about their weapons on the outside. A very good or much improved offensive line with the two additions of Trey Turner and Brian Balaga. I, Greeny, I just can't wrap my head around the fact that Cam Newton's not going to be a starting quarterback. I think that the Chargers should at least entertain it. But if that doesn't happen, I also think the Chargers should draft Jordan Love at the sixth pick. So um, I just can't wrap my brain around Cam Newton not being a potential starting quarterback in 2020. All right, Dan, Marcus, stay with me. Much more football as we go. But there's other news out there in the sports world. And let's start with this. The Lakers players were tested for the coronavirus yesterday, four days or coming after four Brooklyn Nets players, excuse me, tested positive. Brooklyn and the Lakers were the last opponents before play was suspended. Last night, the NBA's commissioner, Adam Silver, was with Rachel Nichols here on ESPN talking about three scenarios the league is considering in trying to return. I'd say I'm looking at three different things here. One is, of course, when can we restart and operate as we've known it, 19,000 fans in buildings. Then option two is, should we consider restarting without fans? And what would that mean? Because presumably, um, if you had a group of players and staff around them and you could test them and you could follow some protocol, doctors, health officials may say it's safe to play. And then a third option, are there conditions in which a group of players 
could compete, you know, and maybe it's for a giant fundraiser or just for the collective good of the people that you take a, a, a subset of players and is there a protocol in which um, they can be tested and quarantined and, or isolated in some way and then they can comp com compete against each other just because people are stuck at home and I think they need a diversion, they need to be entertained. And, and I just add to that point, you know, to the extent we were, we were the first to shut our league down, in what way can we be a first mover to help restart the economy? So obviously the coronavirus has had an extraordinary impact on the world of sports. Here's just a small smattering of it. Baseball delaying opening day and we don't know when they're coming back. MLS suspending their 25th anniversary season for a month and the NHL suspending the remainder of their current season and still waiting to see where that will go. And for some answers, uh, we are delighted to be able to bring in the commissioner of the National Hockey League, Gary Bettman, and thank you so much for doing this, Gary. You just you just heard from Adam Silver there talking about the way he is approaching the possibilities of a return. I would ask you the same question. What are the options for the NHL right now? Well, the options, first of all, good morning. morning. I hope you're feeling good, as are your listeners. Uh, the, the options are obvious, and we're all exploring them. Uh, the fact of the matter is none of us is going to be able to do anything until we get it all clear on some basis. Uh, we, too, have explored and continue to explore every scenario, uh, which will depend on the timing of, of when it's safe to go out. Uh, but I think the most important thing in the short term is we should be focusing not just in sports, but we can be a good example on the fact that, that self-isolation is going to help the spread uh, or reduce the spread of the coronavirus. And that's what we're focused on, keeping our players safe and setting a good example. Obviously, that is important. I, I do want to hear your thoughts on what the all clear looks like. Wh whom is it that you are consulting with on those sorts of things? I think sports fans would be interested to hear someone in your position who has all of this, um, so much responsibility. From where would you get that all clear? And who are the people that you consult with and hear from? Well, we, we have our own internal medical people that we use on a regular basis, uh, and we also have consultants uh, who are a specialist in infectious disease. Uh, but more importantly, it's going to be what the local governments and perhaps the federal government tell us about what is safe. In other words, we, we were playing uh, as governments one by one were suggesting, uh, first suggesting and then ordering that sports stop playing. I mean, when, when the NBA stopped, uh, obviously they had to deal with the fact that a player had tested positive and the team wouldn't take the court and they had a full building of fans. Uh, we discontinued, suspended the rest of the season a little off. We're taking a pause, but we suspended the next day because every scenario we came up when we were all playing with said that once a player tested positive, it was over. Uh, in terms of being able to continue to play. Uh, after seeing what the NBA went through, it was clear to me that a positive test was inevitable uh, and that uh, why wait for that to happen? Let's stop playing now. And that's why I had a call with the board on Thursday. And by Thursday night, we had taken a pause in the season. But a lot of what's going to happen, we can be as creative as sports leagues as we want and we should be. We should be considering every scenario, whether or not we play to full buildings, whether or not we play to empty buildings. But it's going to be determined by people uh, and organizations beyond us with the scientific and medical expertise that will tell us when it's OK to play. Curious about the calendar. That, that's obviously something that there's so much uncertainty. But your season generally ends around the same time as the NBA's does. The playoffs and the Stanley Cup finals will end sometime in early June. Um, and, and then you go into their summer and the next season's considerations. So is there a point at which it will become impossible for you to continue this season or to have a playoff for this year? Well, I believe that under the current circumstances, we can go later than we've ever gone. Uh, how late is a good question. Uh, what we want to make sure of is that we don't do anything uh, that from this season that might impact next season having the normalcy it's supposed to have. So the, the two factors are timing relative to how late we can go without impacting next season uh, and making sure that whatever we do competitively, if we're going to complete this current season, it has to have integrity. It has to be respectful 
of the well over 100-year history of the Stanley Cup. Uh, and that's something we're very focused on. And finally, I would ask you, what, what are you hearing from your players during this time when there was so much uncertainty for all of us? What, what kinds of things, questions are you hearing from your players? Well, the, the, question, the, the questions that get the most uh, asked relate to testing. Um, we, we've, we had a test positive our first two nights ago. Uh, there have been some players testing, but the medical advice that we're being given is that if you're asymptomatic, there's no reason to be tested because it's not going to tell you anything. So we're not over-testing. We're testing when it's appropriate. And when there's uh, a situation, whether it's a player or a family member or an executive, we then have to go back and trace contacts that may have been had and whether or not they were meaningful contacts. But in the final analysis, getting people, whether it's sports or society as a whole, to self-isolate and reduce the spread of the coronavirus is probably the most important thing that any of us can do. And then a quick final question for you here. I only have a moment, but I would wonder, with so many of you, we just showed how many of the different sports leagues have been impacted by this. What, if any, communication and, and brainstorming have you done with people like Adam Silver and the leaders of the other sports who are being impacted by this? Uh, we've all been in contact. We're all dealing with the same issues. We're all having similar responses. Uh, I don't think anyone has a, a, a magic potion as to what the right thing to do is. Uh, we're all staying flexible. We're all considering the alternatives. We're all staying uh, in touch with our constituents. I have uh, at least one conference call a day with, with a task force that we have internally at the NHL. We're having conference calls on a regular basis uh, with our clubs. Uh, we send memos out every day with an update. Uh, we've got to keep everybody completely informed because, A, it's important that they have the information, and, B, in terms of having a sense of calm, the more information people have, the more realistic they can be in dealing with this. Gary, I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. We'll, we'll talk again under hopefully more cheerful circumstances. You stay safe, and thank you very much for the time. Thank you, and you too. Stay safe, stay healthy. All right, take care. That's Gary Bettman, the commissioner of the National Hockey League. Again, there are just so many more questions right now than there are answers. We'll continue. Tom Brady to Tampa. A lot of answers we're looking for there. Lewis Riddick will provide them right after this.